The self-help genre, especially when mixed in with new age concepts, always leaves me skeptical. There is a certain laziness to the simplified rehashing of ancient concepts, repackaged as if they were new. However, I did take note when both my mom and Kendrick Lamar took an interest in the famous author Eckhart Tolle, who is best known for his work The Power of Now. And so I temporarily put aside my skepticism and embarked on reading his seminal work. What is there worthwhile to learn from Eckhart Tolle? This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Have you ever wondered why some animals are so much larger than others, or why the sky is blue, or what the inside of a black hole looks like? It can be kind of difficult and boring to sit through a whole research article on these topics, if only there was a fun way to learn about science and math. Thankfully, I have Brilliant to turn to. Brilliant is a fun and interactive platform with an insane amount of STEM-related courses to fuel your curiosity about the world around you. With Brilliant, anyone can understand concepts about science, math, and coding. Their interactive puzzles and quizzes allow for an easy and fun path towards learning real problem solving, no matter the topic. I've been having a fun time going through Brilliant's Kurzgesagt Beyond the Nutshell course, which is in collaboration with the hugely popular YouTube channel. Not only have I been able to answer the questions as to why some animals are larger than others, I also learned about the deeply disturbing zombie-like virus that is rabies. I would highly recommend this course for any avid science lover. Visit the link in the description below to get started learning STEM for free, and the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. Before I launch into his ideas, it's best I provide a short summary of who he is. Born in a small German town in 1948, he moved to Spain with his father afterwards, where he would be homeschooled, teaching himself literature, astronomy, and different languages. Importantly, he came across the work of the German mystic Joseph Anton Schneiderfranken, who wrote extensively on the necessity of doubt within faith and the importance of practical experience. His frank writing style appears to be a heavy influence on Toll. At 19, Toll would move to England and teach German and Spanish. However, after his time in academia, Toll found himself increasingly depressed. One night in 1977, his misery grew to an extreme level of anguish. He felt the meaninglessness of it all, and he loathed his own existence. However, on this night, Toll's very self-loathing would also produce a life-changing revelation. I cannot live with myself any longer. This was the thought that kept repeating itself in my mind. Then suddenly, I became aware of what a peculiar thought it was. Am I one or two? If I cannot live with myself, there must be two of me, the I and the self that I cannot live with. Maybe, I thought, only one of them is real. Toll experienced an extreme sense of joy in this moment of insight. He no longer felt fear. For the next five months, he would live in total peace, sleeping in Buddhist monasteries and enjoying two years sitting on park benches. He had no relationships, possessions, nor even a home. Nonetheless, he was extremely happy. Soon afterwards, he moved to Vancouver, where he finished his famous work, The Power of Now, which was published in 1997. Oprah happened to read this book, skyrocketing it to the New York Times bestsellers list. Toll quickly became a household name. Although he has stated that he has no interest in creating a heavy commercial structure, he does continue to find relative financial success selling spiritual guides and materials on his website. Toll possesses a great talent in summarizing and linking concepts between ideologies and religions. Buddhism, Christianity, Zen, and esoteric mysticism all seep into his work. This is largely due to his epistemological claim that, in essence, there is and always has been only one spiritual teaching, although it comes in many forms. Toll is also against the strict categorization or conceptualization of ideas, lending to his ability to blend philosophies at ease. He sees words as simply stepping stones, urging the reader to not get so caught up on terms such as being or God. Being, for example, he argues is impossible to understand mentally. Rather, it can only be felt through an awareness with the present. The concept of being should be further explored. 
Toll disagrees with Descartes' identification of thinking with being, namely his argument that to think is to prove one's existence only leads to an over-identification with one's mind. The product of this is usually the compulsive thinker. The compulsive thinker lives in a state of apparent separateness, in an insanely complex world of continuous problems and conflict, a world that reflects the ever-increasing fragmentation of the mind. Whereas compulsive thinking lends solely to a world of division, enlightenment revolves around a sense of wholeness and unity with the world and oneself. Here Toll encourages the reader to actively rebel against our identification with the mind, the possessing entity as our true self. Instead, we are to act as an observing entity that watches the thinker or the mind in a non-judgmental way. This allows one to become aware of one's own presence, leading to a new dimension of consciousness. Does this mean that you should just stop thinking? Tola urges us to use the mind as an instrument rather than allowing it to use us as such. He argues that many are addicted to thinking and act in an unconscious manner throughout the day, constantly trapped in the past or future and never in the present. This is best exemplified by one of the products of the dualistic mind, the pleasure-pain cycle. We tend to chase pleasure and thus are in a state of pain until we are temporarily satisfied. Pleasure is always derived from something outside of you, whereas joy arises from within. The very thing that gives you pleasure today will give you pain tomorrow, or it will leave you so its absence will give you pain. This closely tracks with the Buddha's idea that cravings are simply the mind seeking salvation through external things. Not only is this apparent in substance abuse and the need for material goods, this craving can also include the idea that a romantic partner will make us fulfilled or even the craving for enlightenment itself. As he suggests, to get over the constant chase that will only lead to the realization that external things cannot bring you fulfillment, you need to die before you die. Simply put, you must strip away all that is not you, all externalities. Time and time again, Toll reminds us that enlightenment is within, every moment, and salvation is to simply be in the present. One of the greatest obstacles to living in the present is trauma and the deep pain of the past. Toll defines this as the pain body, which is the accumulation of past pain that comes in the form of a negative energy field that inhabits both your mind and body. The influence of the pain body on any individual is relative. For some, it may lie relatively dormant, only to emerge in certain situations, such as intimate relationships. For others, the pain body could be constantly active. Whatever the case, the pain body is conceptualized as an organism that feeds off of negative energy such as anger or self-destructiveness. It increases in effectiveness the less someone is aware of it. This is because the less someone is aware, the more likely they are to unconsciously identify with it. Soon people define themselves as the trauma or the victim, allowing the past to define their present. Toll argues that the greatest escape from the pain body is through, you guessed it, becoming conscious through greater awareness with the present. The pain body is afraid of the light of the consciousness, striving always to live in the shadows of the unconscious. It bets on the fact that you fear fully facing the pain that lives within you. Thus, to reduce identification with it, you must accept it as part of the present, thereby making it conscious and reducing the resistance it feeds off of. The pain body is closely linked to Toll's categorization of time. He argues that there are two different times, psychological time and clock time. Psychological time is the identification with the past, both in the form of troubling memories and blissful nostalgia. Here we never give the space to form new memories, and our present has the potential to be ruined by the past. Similarly, psychological time also refers to the continuous compulsive projection into the future. We either worry far too much about things that are not guaranteed, or anxiously await things that are never quite as good as we would hope. The unconscious person drifts between the past and future, unable to settle in the present. The enlightened person focuses on the now and remains somewhat aware of clock time. Clock time allows us to learn from past mistakes, set goals, and make basic predictions. It allows us to survive and provides a useful tool for living rather than keeping us from enjoying the present. How to actually live in the now Toll suggests esoteric waiting, a total alertness where something could happen at every moment. Try this. Simply close your eyes and say to yourself, what will my next thought be? You quickly become aware of the fact that you are not only your thoughts, but 
rather an observer, a watcher. This may even lead to Satori, a flash of insight and awe that requires your total presence. You may notice that the world is more colorful, or that the issue at work isn't really a big deal, or you may happen upon a creative idea. This is all due to the simple realization that for most of your life you have decided to be somewhere else. You think that you can't get there from where and who you are at this moment because you are not yet complete or good enough, but the truth is that here and now is the only point from where you can get there. Eckhart Tolle does drift into the pseudoscientific realm that so often characterizes New Age thinkers. His discussion on his approach and its effect on the aging process, strengthening the immune system, and the menstrual cycle should probably involve a more scientific approach than simply stating, try it out and you will be the evidence. Likewise, his sociological application of the pain body on race and gender may seem useful for some and crude for others. Nonetheless, I did find a great deal of useful reminders about mindfulness that should be applicable to almost anyone struggling with anxiety or depression. His body of work should not be taken as a serious academic inquiry, and I actually think that this does more good than harm as many of the ideas he presents are simply watered-down concepts that do involve a great deal of familiarity with philosophy and theology. Overall, I would argue that Eckhart Tolle is one of the more harmless members of a lineage of white men advocating for a reductive and secular application of Eastern philosophy to the dispirited West. However, I would also highly recommend checking out some other sources in the description that elaborate on Tolle's philosophy. Let him, like words, be a stepping stone.